You're about to hear a message from one of our experiences right here at Hope Church on Sunday morning. But before you watch, before you do that, hold up. Click the subscribe button so you can stay up to date with all the videos we're going to be dropping every single week. We hope you enjoy this message. But we're in a series right now um, called Enthroned. We started this last week, um, and this series is all about praise and worship, one of the most powerful um, weaponry that God can give his people is praise and worship. How many of you agree with that? Yeah, and so I just really feel a, a um, I guess if you want to call it a, a burden, but just a, uh, this thing on me to teach God's people just the importance of praise and how important the, the, the principles of praise and worship are um, and just how strategic they are in your walk with Christ and just how powerful they can be. Last week, we talked about that, about the protocol for his presence. Um, if you want to know God's address, it's P.O. Box Praise. It's P.O. Box Praise. And that's where God lives. In fact, um, you can stand to your feet. We're going to look at Psalm 22, 3 again. This is our vision verse for this whole series. Psalm 22 and 3, it says, but you are holy, enthroned. Everybody say that word. Enthroned. Everybody say it again. Enthroned. Enthroned in the praises of Israel. Now, you and I, uh, of course, are not, some of us might be, but are not physically from Israel. We are the spiritual family. And we are, uh, according to Galatians, heirs according to the promise that was given. And so we receive these promises. When it says Israel, we receive those promises. Anybody with me? And so when it says he's enthroned in the praises of Israel, that word enthroned, remember, remember means to have a seat of authority or influence. And I hope this week that you've been given God the seat <laughs> that's reserved for him and not given every other thing that seat. Because we can worship a lot of stuff. You can worship a lot of stuff but God. We can praise everything but God. But it's when we choose to put him in enthron that enthroned seat of authority or influence that it has praise has power in our life. So Psalm 22, 3, you are holy, O Lord, enthroned in the praises of Israel. Now I want you to go to Isaiah 43. Isaiah 43, verse 21. They'll put it on the screens also. One thing I'm a big advocate of and I want to challenge you to do this. I know technology is great. I utilize it all the time. No problem with that. But I think make it a practice to bring your Bible to church with you. I think it's a good practice. It just puts something in your hand. You know what I mean? You just, it just feels like you got a sword with you. You know what I mean? Like I use my phone. I study the Bible on my phone. I'm not, don't hear me say that. Okay. I'm just saying. Let's make it a practice to bring our Bible. I think there's, there's something to that. Anybody with me on that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's just try it. Let's just try it. Isaiah 43, 21, it says, through the prophet Isaiah, the Lord says, This people I have formed for myself, watch this, they shall declare my praise. This people I have formed or I have created for myself, they shall declare my praise. I want to talk to them from the topic today, the power of praise. The power of praise. Tell the person next to you, there is power when you praise. Father, open our ears, open our hearts today. We thank you for the word. God, we thank you for what you've already done, that you've already met with us, you're already here. I pray, Lord, that you would uh, just use the words you've given me to speak to pierce the heart of every person in earshot of this message. Lord, I always count it a privilege and an honor, the highest privilege and honor, to stand before one person and share the gospel, much less uh, a few hundred. So God, I thank you for the privilege of doing so. There's a lot more people that can do this better. But God, you've chosen me, so use me as an instrument today. Move me out of the way. I, move anything out of me, not of you. And let me speak clearly. Let me hear you clearly to speak what your people need to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You can be seated. Say, there's power in my praise. When we understand the purpose of why something was created, it helps us utilize the power that it has more effectively. Let me say that again. When we understand the purpose of why something was created, it helps us utilize the power 
that it has more effectively. Did you get that? Each of us have a calling in life that has been given to us by God. How many know you have a calling from God? You have a call of God on your life to do something unique and specific in the earth that God gave you to do. Each of us have a calling. The purpose of our calling is to ultimately fulfill what we were created to do. So then, we could say we don't just do what we are called to do, we have to do what we were created to do. Let me explain. Because I'm called to preach the gospel. That's my calling. My, my calling in life is to po point people to the cross, point people to Jesus, point people to the Lord Jesus Christ. That is my calling. It is to lead people and shepherd his people. That, that's my calling. You have a, a calling. We all, so our callings are going to vary. Our callings are going to be different, but the reason we were all created remains the same. Are you tracking with me? So my calling, of course, as a pastor is to point people to Jesus, but the reason I was created was to give God praise through the calling that he's given me. You could be a banker sitting in here or watching this online, and your calling is to deal with numbers. Your calling, and God bless you, your calling is to deal with statistics, percentages, all those things that, that have to be dealt with, but ultimately that calling... That calling was given to you to ultimately perform the purpose for your creation, which is to give God praise. You could be a coach, a teacher. You can be an auto mechanic, whatever it might be that God has called you to do and he's gifted you to do. The ultimate purpose of that calling is to give God praise. Isaiah 43, 21, these people I have formed for myself, they shall declare my praise. This is why we were created. I was created for praise. I was created to praise God. Everything about me was designed to give God praise. Our physical makeup was designed to give God praise. From our clapping of the hands and the sound that it makes to our vocal cords and the different uh, pitches and melodies that we can sing to everything with our mouth to our feet. Our whole body was designed to praise God. You are a walking praise party all by yourself. So we were created to praise. Say that. Say, I was created to praise. We were created to praise. But the Lord says, this people I have formed, I have created for myself. They shall declare my praise. So what does God do to form this people that are created to praise him? You're going to have to stay with me, just track with me, lean in, listen in, because we're going to some great places today. He, how does he form? Well, he starts off by forming this people by promising a man named Abraham that his seed shall multiply on the earth so much that his seed, his, his generations after him, will be like the sand on the seashore and the stars in the sky. That's how many that Abraham is going to produce and are going to come through his family line. He says they're going to be like the sand on the seashore. That represents our earthly family. But then he says they're going to be like the stars in the sky. That represents the heavenly or the spiritual family. That's you and me. And God promises Abraham this thousands and thousands of years ago. And so he promises this man, Abraham, that he's going to multiply on the earth. Then, and I'm paraphrasing a lot for the sake of time, then Abraham has a son named Isaac. He has a son named Isaac, and after Isaac, Isaac has a son named Jacob, right? And so when you read in Scripture, he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's these three that he's talking about. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob then has 12 sons that God forms into tribes. He forms into tribes because why? He's forming a people. He's forming a people. And so he begins to form these tribes. And in these tribes, there are names given to each son that represents the tribes that God is forming. One of the names of the tribes is Judah. That's one of the tribes that God forms into what he's doing. Remember, remember, when we understand the purpose of why something was created, we can help utilize the power more effectively. Remember that statement. Because the word Judah in the Hebrew, many of you know this, what does it mean? 
It means praise. It means praise. And so the fact that God takes a tribe out of the sons of Jacob and calls him Judah or calls him praise gives us an indicator that he's forming something. He's doing something uh, with this whole beginning of a nation. Judah is so important in the Bible. You need to understand the role that Judah plays in the Bible. The Bible tells us in Numbers chapter 2 verse 3 that when the tribes of Israel were in, in camps and they were traveling through the wilderness, God gave specific instructions for Judah uh, or praise. So anytime you hear Judah, just think praise. So God gives specific instructions for the tribe of Judah. The tribe of Judah, watch this, always camped to the east of the tent of meeting in the wilderness. The tent of meeting now is where the presence of God would reside and where Moses would go in and meet with God. And so the tribe of Judah always camped to the east of the entrance, which when they faced east was the rising of the sun. They faced that way because that's the direction the sun rose from. But interestingly enough, they were also strategically positioned to the east of the tent of meeting is because they were the only ones in front of the entrance. It's going to make sense to you in a minute. They were the only ones right there in front of the entrance. Mm. Judah, according to Numbers chapter 2 verse 9, whenever Israel broke camp and began to move, that it was Judah who led the way and broke camp first. It was praise that left the camp first and everybody else followed. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, uh, when Israel went to war, according to Judges chapter 1 and Judges chapter 20, when Israel went to war, the Lord told Israel, Judah shall go first. Judah shall go first. And then ultimately, we read, through the bloodline of Judah, Jesus Christ, our Savior, was born through the tribe of Judah. What am I trying to tell you? I'm trying to tell you that, that and trying to get you to understand that is that praise was designed by God to initiate every movement of his presence among his people. Let me say that again. Praise was designed to initiate every movement and advancement of God's people. Whether it was breaking camp and moving in a direction, praise went first. Whenever there was a battle that his people were facing, praise went first. And whenever we needed healing and deliverance and whenever we needed freedom and whenever we needed to be pulled out of darkness and whenever we needed to be rescued from the grips and the fire flames of hell, whenever we needed a savior, God brought a movement named Jesus through the tribe of Judah, through the tribe of praise. I'm trying to tell somebody it is praise that always signals movement. It is praise that always signals advancement amongst the people of God so you can stay quiet if you want to but for me in my house and for this church we're gonna be a church of praise because this is a church of advancement because this is a people of movement I'm not staying stuck where I was I got too much in front of me and guess what the vehicle will be to get me there it will be praise come on why don't you give him some praise right now because you know He's advancing your life. He's fighting the battle for you. And praise always goes first. Right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Somebody say, praise goes first. You need to understand what the power of praise is. Now, praise has power with it. Praise is not just something we talk about. It's not just something that we, we would just mention and we move on. Praise is your weapon. And I'm concerned for many believers, many Christians who are, have not yet picked up their weapon of praise. My question is, how do you expect to win when you don't pick up your weapon? How do you expect to win when you do not pick up your weapon? Last week I told you, praise must be willingly given. It must be a willing sacrifice. And many times people are not winning because they're not willing. I want you to think about that. They're not winning because they're not willing. Praise costs them too much. Their feelings get in the way. And they don't feel like giving God praise. And they just want to remain silent. But I just came to tell you heaven is not silent. Heaven is not quiet. So you might as well get some good practice while you're down here. 
So what does praise have the power to do? I told you last week, it's the protocol for his presence. If you want more of God, then you've got to become a person of praise and worship. What does, the, what does praise have power to do, though? Watch, watch this. Write this down. Number one, praise has the power to silence and stifle the enemy. How many know we got a real enemy called the devil, the adversary, the roaring lion who seeks to devour? We have an enemy. I am, I am certain and I am convinced, according to Scripture, that when you become a person of praise, it shuts the mouth of the enemy. Some of us have been giving too much notice to the voice of the enemy. We've been turning up the volume of the voice of the enemy, and we can't hear a word from the Lord on our next step. You need to shut that voice up by activating a praise in your life. Act, become a person that just becomes full of thanksgiving. Even when bad things happen, begin to thank God. You, you used to thank God when you got the front row parking spot at the grocery store. But if somebody pulls in front of you and you got to park a distance away, just thank him that you could get two legs to walk to the door anyway. So you got to flip that thing because you can get irritated or, or, or you can give God praise. You can complain or you can give God thanks. I'm just choosing to become a person of praise and thanksgiving. But praise silences and stifles the enemy. Look at Psalm 8 verse 2. I'm going to show you some parallels here between Old and New Testament. How many know Old Testament is Jesus concealed, New Testament is Jesus revealed? Psalm 8, verse 2, it says, Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have ordained strength. Say that phrase, ordained strength. Ordained, ordained strength because of who? Your enemies. Your enemies. Watch this. That you may what? Silence the enemy and the avenger. Right there in Scripture. He is out of the mouth. See that? that something has to be activated out of your mouth. There's something that happens when Crystal was up here. Somebody said on the worship team that you have to speak something into the atmosphere. Remember this. Everything in the kingdom of God always begins with a decree or a declaration. Remember that. Everything in the kingdom of God always begins with a decree and a declaration. Everything. Psalm 8 says, out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have ordained strength. Because of your enemies that you may silence the enemy. Silence the enemy. Praise silences the enemy. But I want you to see something in Matthew 21, verse 16. Old and New Testament. See, Psalm 8 says, you have ordained strength out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants. Jesus says this in Matthew 21, 16. He says that out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have perfected praise. You have perfected praise. Now, I think Jesus isn't quoting the Bible wrong. I don't think he's doing that because he is the word. So I think the word knows what he's talking about. So what then is this Psalm 8 and 2 ordained strength and Matthew 21 and 16 perfected praise? I want you to look at who he's talking about. Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, both are said from the psalmist and from our Savior, that these, this is the people group. Now, he's not talking about just little children, but there is a prophetic picture here that nursing babes and infants, how many don't, don't have much strength? Nursing babes and infants don't have much power. They're, they're dependent on those, uh, the, those who birthed them to feed them. And so he's giving us a picture that those who have ordained strength from God and those who operate in the perfected praise of God are those who aren't strong enough to, to, to stand on their own. It's those who aren't bold or big enough to fight on their own. They need strength. They need, they need help. And, and the psalmist and Jesus is saying part of the way that you get the ordained strength from God is to step into the place of perfected praise when you are at your weakest and you are at your lowest. But how many know every time you face a challenge in your life and you face a battle in your life and it gets, starts to get dark and it feels heavy, that is when it is the most difficult time to worship God. But see, here's what we do. We'll say, well, I don't want to lift my hands. It won't be sincere because I don't really feel like doing it. That's the perfect time to lift your hands. Because you know why? You're telling your flesh you're not going to dictate and determine how much praise I give to God. 
Some of y'all submit your praise to your personality so much you miss out on breakthroughs that God wants to bring into your life because you're just not an extrovert, because you're not an extroverted person. And so you sit there stuck in situations and bondage that praise could break through for you if you would get over your prideful, egotistical self and say, this ain't about me anyway. I might not feel like singing. I might not feel like thanking God. I might not feel like lifting my hands, but that's the perfect time to do it because in that pain and in that hardship is where my praise gets perfected. Think about the hardest moment of your life, the hardest seasons of your life. Some of you might be facing them right now, and it's a challenge for you to even tell God thank you. Because you're looking around wondering, how can I give him thanks? What is there to be thankful for? But you got to understand, this season of hardship you're facing, let me say, help me Holy Ghost say this right. This season of hardship that, that's unique to you may be the only time in your life history you will be able to give God praise in this type of season. Does that make sense? Like, the praise you give God in this hard season will be like the custom-made praise. You understand what I'm saying? Like, because you may never face what you're facing ever again. And, and so the praise I give him in the face of this obstacle is going to be a once-in-a-lifetime type praise. You, you see what I'm saying? So because I never, you never may face bankruptcy ever again. But when you give him praise, standing in the face of bankruptcy, it makes your praise a sweet-smelling incense to him that only you could give. And when you choose to praise God when the doctor's report was contrary to what you were believing for, and yet you still decide to give him praise when the tumor still is on the x-ray and when the issue is still in the doctor's room, and yet you still ask the doctor, hey, can you step outside the room for a little bit? I know you just told me the worst news of my life, but I need a moment to praise my God. See, it's in that season the devil don't know what to do with you. The enemy don't know what to do with you because he's throwing everything he can at you. But when you take that thing and you flip it on him and you say, you thought you were going to kill me with this, but I'm only going to praise him a little more. That's when your praise gets so much more unique and so much more custom to what your life is facing. And then guess what? The angels in heaven, they lean over and say, I don't know how they're giving God praise in the midst of that. Why? Because angels praise God from a perfect place. But when you're down here facing hell on earth and still decide, I'm going to praise him anyway, you teach your angels how to praise God. Because they don't know pain. They don't know suffering. You do. And you're teaching the angels how to praise God from an even more pure place. Because they ain't facing what you're facing. Come on, somebody give God praise for 10 seconds. Just thank him right there. Come on. Hallelujah. Come on, why don't you teach your angel something? They're looking over heaven, that great cloud of witnesses, and saying, I'm excited they're praising God. I don't, my God, give them more strength to face what they're facing. Give them more ability. Give them more power. Lord God, because I didn't, I didn't have to face what they're facing. I'm in your presence 24-7. Hallelujah. Tell your neighbor, teach your angel something. Teach your angel something. Your praise silences the enemy. Your praise shuts the enemy up. And when the enemy tries to turn the fire up even hotter, your praise brings the presence of God into your situation. It silences the enemy, but guess what it also does? It stifles. It keeps down. Look at Genesis 49. I told you about Judah, didn't I? Genesis 49, verse 8, when Jacob was blessing his sons, the, the tribe that would become the tribes. Look what he says to Judah. He says to Judah, Judah, you are he whom your brothers shall praise. And he's prophetically speaking of Jesus. Watch this. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Ethan, come here. Hurry. 
Where is Judah's hand supposed to be? Where is praise's hand supposed to be? One thing I know about that, Ethan, I'm not going to hurt you too much. Your hand shall be on the neck. When somebody's got their hand on your neck, they can control where you go. When somebody's got their hand on your neck, you can't do much, and you become under the control of the authority of the hand that rests on your neck. So every time, raise your hand up. Nope. You ain't going to tell me how broke I am because I got to praise. Raise your hand up. Nope. My marriage may look like it's in shambles right now, but I will yet praise him. Raise your hand up. Nope. I haven't heard the doctor's report reversed yet, but I'm going to give him praise because if he heals me or not, he's still a healer, and I'm going to keep on believing that he's going to make a way. Raise your hand up. Nope. I'm not going to get frustrated by racism and by the... The, the derogatory terms my co-workers call me. You know why? Because they didn't make me this beautiful skin color. My God made me this skin color. Raise your hand up. And no, I'm going to prosper in the land of the living. I shall have all that I need. The next time the enemy tries to tell you what you don't have and what you do have and what's bad and what don't look good, you let that joker know, no, you go back right down there. You ain't raising your ugly head up in this situation. Hallelujah. Grab your neighbors. I'm just kidding. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do it. That could get really crazy. I don't want to start no fights. I won't start no fights. Your praise silences and it stifles the enemy. He don't know what to do with you. When you begin to activate a praise out of your mouth. You notice Psalm 8 and Matthew 21 both start off saying out of the mouth. It has to come out of your mouth. Why do you think the enemy fights us so much on our language? Because if we start talking defeated and we keep talking about our losses, where we failed, and who you're never going to be, and what they said you're never going to be, you will talk yourself right into the trap the enemy has set for you. I'm not telling you not to acknowledge the reality of life. We don't do that. I'm talking about you stare right in the face, but yet you see a greater hope behind it. That's what faith has the ability to do. I see what's in front of me, but I see something greater behind it. And praise helps you get that kind of perspective. It silences and stifles the enemy. Ethan, your neck okay? All right, I just I didn't want to make sure. I don't want to hurt you, you know. Don't sue me. So it silences and it stifles the enemy. Uh, number two, our praise makes the enemy flee and ushers in deliverance. It makes the enemy flee and ushers in deliverance. One of the most famous stories we can talk about is found in 2 Chronicles chapter 20 when a king named Jehoshaphat put his praise and worship leaders out in front of the army when three enemy armies were surrounding them. How many know you better trust God if you're the praise and worship team being sent out and you ain't got no weapons? Zach, can you imagine if there was a military army about to overtake this place and I said to the worship team, y'all take your guitars, your drums, your microphones, go out there, y'all going to lead us. And we're going to wait till y'all go out <laughs> and see if it's all good. That's essentially what Jehoshaphat's doing. He's telling all the praise and worship leaders, y'all get out front and y'all are going to sing. That's our strategy. Do you understand that was the warfare strategy? And they begin to sing and to praise God. And they're out front. The enemy is, 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 is uh, advancing on them. And they begin to praise God. And the Bible says the Lord began to cause the enemy to destroy each other. Because there was a people who trusted in the name of the Lord so much so, they knew that their praise was a weapon. You got to know your praise is one of the best weapons you could ever utilize. Pray when I can praise God when the enemy surrounds me. And 2 Chronicles 20 says that when they began to sing, they weren't even at the location yet. 
They began to sing, and their praise went before them. And when they arrived at the battlefield, they saw all the enemy destroyed. They weren't even at the battlefield yet, but their praise went ahead of them. Their praise went ahead of them into an atmosphere that they had no business fighting in. But God said, your praise is a weapon. And when you praise me, you activate things in the spirit realm. You cause my host of heavenly armies to act on your behalf. I dare you before you go into the meeting with your boss tomorrow to just begin to thank God and say, God, I thank you for your being my provision. This job is a great job, but ultimately you're my provider. I'm going to worship you no matter the outcome of this meeting. I'm going to praise you no matter what. And just begin to praise God in advance before any decisions are even made. That's how much we have to believe in this weapon called praise. To believe that my praise actually can cause the enemy to flee. And it can actually cause deliverance to be ushered in. Watch this. Paul and Silas in Acts 16. is verses 16 through 40. You can go back and look at it. They're in a Philippian jail. Paul and Silas. What would y'all do if they threw me in prison and, and for preaching the gospel. And all of a sudden my praise activates the prison doors and an earthquake to cause everything to bust open and every prisoner walks out of their cell. Think about this and just, just in your mind for a moment. Because this is what's happening. Leaders of the church have been arrested. And it's not looking so hot for them. And they're thrown into a prison. And the Bible says at about midnight, which represents a, the darkest hour. Let's just say it's, just, it's darkness. It's dark. It's a dark situation. They're locked up. Their feet are in shackles. They can't move. They're in stocks. They can't move. And all of a sudden, Paul gets Silas going, and they began to sing. Now, I don't know if it sounded good. I don't know if they had any kind of harmony going on, if this was the first church duet that we've ever experienced. <laughs> but they began to sing at about midnight. Watch this. Their situation said, shut up. Their situation said, stay quiet. It don't make sense. So anytime you hear us say, give him a praise that don't make no sense, we're not just exhorting you to do something just foolish and stupid. We're literally saying, praise, give God a praise that if those who knew your situation heard about what you're going through, it wouldn't make any sense to tell God thank you. And so Paul and Silas are giving God a praise that don't make sense. And they're praising God, and the ground begins to shake. The atmosphere begins to shift. That's what praise can do. It can shift an atmosphere. That's why if you ever get the chance to go into a hospital room and pray for a sick person, you better get your attitude right. Get your spirit right. Don't go in there with some doom and gloom. Well, well we hope we get better. No, we go in with the authority of the Lord Jesus and with a praise on your lips and with an edification and an encouragement and say, you shall get up out of this bed. You will live and not die. And begin to speak into the atmosphere. Praise will change an atmosphere. And they began to sing and they began to praise. And the walls began to shake and the doors busted open. And all the prisoners got out. The key part of that I love about that story in Acts 16 is it says, while Paul and Silas were singing, it says the other prisoners were listening. They were listening. They might not have known how to praise but they were in the presence of somebody who knew how to praise. I told you this last week, but I feel it's worth repeating. I would not sit next to anybody when I come to church who don't know how to praise God. If they sit there like a knot on a log, I would get my stuff and say, let me find somebody who's already pacing the floor a little bit. Can't wait for the music to start because they got to pray. Somebody who's got about, who's got a clipboard and about three or four Bibles with them. That's the kind of, you know who I'm talking about. One of them old school saints who come with a dictionary to church. They got a, a lexicon and a Strong's concordance today and they got it all. That's who I want to sit next to because they know something about some fights. They know something about some warfare. They know something about how to give God praise when it ain't looking good. We don't need any more fair weather praisers. I'm not impressed when you can praise God when everything is perfect in your life, when your children are acting right, when your money looks good. 
when everything is right. That don't impress God much. But it's when you get in a midnight hour season. It's when you get in a dark season and you allow that voice. Oh, Lord, I'm going to praise you anyway. Jesus, I'm going to give you thanks anyway. I thank you that I'm still breathing and I can still give you your praise because you deserve it no matter what. That's who I want to sit next to. That's who I want to sit next to. So I start qualifying. Did you give God praise this week? No? This is your first time? Excuse me. Let me get on down the road. Who am I sitting next to? Are you? Okay. Me and you are about to have a Paul and Silas moment then, baby, because you know something about praising God. Why don't you practice that right now and just go ahead, you and one other person, just say, we're going to praise him together, and we're going to see some things bust open. Praise is my weapon. Hallelujah. Praise is my weapon. Praise causes doors to bust open. Praise can cause spines to be healed, just like our Connections pastor, Zeb Hunley, whose spine was all jacked up, and in a moment of praise and worship, God touched his back. And now he's walking upright. I'm telling you, praise can shift an atmosphere. Come on, out of your mouth. You might as well activate it out of your mouth. It don't make sense for you to say anything good to God. Because some of you have been facing hell since 2022 started. Notices coming in the mail. The job frustrating you. Every issue you can think of. Now inflation's hitting your pocket. But guess what? We gonna see who puts their trust in the Lord and who trusts in chariots. Some may trust in horses, some may trust in chariots, but we will trust in the name of our Lord. Hey! Y'all sit down, I gotta finish, I gotta finish, come on. Don't start, start, don't, don't start, don't start. Hold on, I gotta finish, Josh. I'm doing good on time, Josh. Watch this. Careful, Nick. Careful, Nick. Careful, Nick. Why don't you praise him on the cymbal? Why don't you praise him on the drums, young man? That's what the Bible says in Psalm 150. Praise him on the symbol. to finish, I promise. We're about to finish. You might not get to choose your circumstance, but you do get to choose your praise. You do not get to choose your circumstances sometimes, but you do get to choose your praise. I'm trying to encourage somebody, you didn't choose to have to go to the doctor every week. You didn't choose to have to deal with the things you're dealing with in your household. You didn't choose that, but you do get to choose your response to it. It's called your response ability. It's your ability to respond in a kingdom way. And when you respond with praise, it throws the enemy into confusion. It throws that demonic thing trying to come on you into confusion because they, the enemy don't know what to do with somebody who just always knows how to praise God.
Praise ushered in freedom and deliverance. Yes, it was a great miracle. The earthquake happened for Paul and Silas. It was a great miracle. The doors of the prisons opened up. It was a great miracle that all the prisoners came out. I believe the greatest miracle was when the jailer who watched them and his whole household got saved. And the prisoners, Paul and Silas, who he was watching, were the ones who led him to Jesus and baptized his whole household. To me, it is the greatest miracle of that story because it ushered in deliverance and freedom into a whole generation. A whole generation got turned around because two men decided to praise God in their darkest season. Do you hear me? We will see salvations like we've never seen before when we become a church that knows how to praise God through anything. As long as you are a receiver of mercy, you should always be a giver of praise. And according to Lamentations 3, you get new mercy every day. It silences and stifles the enemy. It ushers in deliverance. Talking about the power of your praise. Last one is this. The power of your praise. Watch this. It helps heal the defeated and the depressed. Depression's real. Don't try to act like, well, I'm a Christian. I'm not going to. No. Depression is real. It tries to come on you in seasons to get you to stop, to get you bogged down, to get you just overwhelmed with life. Praise. Heals the defe- helps heal the defeated and the depressed. Hmm. Watch this. It's one of my just most popular verses, and I hate using that term popular, but Psalm 61, verse 3. Watch this. What does it say? It says that to comfort all. This is, this is a prophetic word that Jesus would repeat in Luke chapter 4. Okay, you with me? And so this is what the psalmist is saying. I'm picking, up, picking it up halfway. What the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me. Let me jump down to verse 3. It says, it's on me to console those who mourn in Zion. We are Zion. To give them beauty for ashes. Beauty for ashes. The oil of joy for mourning. And the what? The garment of praise for a spirit of heaviness. Please make no mistake. We have been given a holy spirit, not a heavy spirit. God, is his purpose for you is not to walk around heavy. He did not give you a heavy spirit. If you're a believer in Jesus and you are filled with the Holy Ghost, he did not give you a heavy spirit. He gave you his holy spirit. And Psalms, Isaiah 61 tells me that part of the anointing of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why I love Jesus. Even Jesus needed to be led by the spirit to do ministry. One of the things as servant leaders and as leaders in this church, we should never attempt to do ministry without the Spirit. That's when it gets carnal and fleshly, and it becomes about men and people, and it becomes this this, uh, 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 pedestal-type church where we worship a man or people more than we do the Creator. And Romans talks about worshiping the creation over the Creator. And we should never worship the creation over the creator. Isaiah 61, it's the spirit of Jesus that causes a garment of praise for a spirit of heaviness. In, in antiquity, in biblical times, when they were in mourning, they would literally wear sackcloth. They would literally put on a specific garment to weep and to cry, and they would even put ashes on their heads to symbolize that they were in grief and they were mourning and they were hurt and they were broken and they were down and they were defeated and they were depressed. And, and this scripture is telling us all of that, that when Jesus, the spirit of Jesus, hmm, comes into a place, that the ashes that have been dumped upon us from the leftover fire. I don't know about you, I don't need any more leftover fire. I need a fresh fire. He takes that old ashes and says, no, I'm going to give you beauty. I'm going to exchange those things. That mourning, that, that, that loss, that, that hurt, all that stuff that you're dealing with inside, I'm going to give you the oil of joy. And then that sackcloth you put on,
Because when you go through stuff in life, it like rests on you. It, it can become a part of you, where it just becomes a part of just what you put on every day. I put on my clothes, my shoes, all that stuff, and then I just put this on. I put on this depression. I put on this bitterness. I put all this on. It's just become a part of your wardrobe. And the Spirit of the Lord says, no, I want to give you a garment that you can put on in exchange for that heaviness you think you got to walk around with. It's called a garment of praise. You may feel defeated. You may feel depressed. According to God's word, praise helps bring us out of a defeated and depressed place. Because it's God's word that says, I want to exchange that defeat. I want to exchange that depression. And I want my presence to totally transform you from defeated to victorious, from depressed to joyful. Psalm 1611 says, you will show me the path of life. In your presence is what? Fullness of joy. In your presence is fullness of joy. What have we been talking about? You want more of God's presence. Praise is the key that opens that door. The protocol for His presence is thanksgiving, for this is the will of God concerning your life. Praise is what brings the presence of God. And your Bible says in Psalm 1611 that in His presence is the cure for the defeat you feel, for the depression you are experiencing. It is the fullness of joy in the presence of God. I'm all for therapy and counselors. I go to a counselor myself. I talk to him about every two weeks because I got some stuff I need to get out. And if I said it on the microphone, y'all wouldn't like me very much. I believe in it. But at the same time, that is not the only solution. I have to be a person of praise that activates a praise out of my mouth and says, God, I'm going to worship you. I'm going to praise you. I feel defeated. I feel stuck, but I'm not going to stop giving you praise. Israel experienced this in Psalm 137. And I'm going to read this, and we're going to pray over some people because I believe there's some people today dealing with defeat, dealing with heaviness, that spirit of heaviness that just rests on you. You don't get excited about nothing. Your expectation is gone. Your hope for the future is depleted. That's when you know that you've fallen into a place of just this rut where you're just satisfied existing and never expect anything greater because you don't want to be disappointed again. And that's where some of our hope is. We have the wrong kind of hope. What I mean is, we hope nothing goes wrong. We hope they don't say something about us. We hope that we don't lose something. We, our hope is in the wrong places. We're hoping not, we're, we're living just to survive. We're not living to thrive, which is our word for 2022. But if you're going to thrive in this year and the rest of it, your praise is going to have to find a new level of thriving. Right. Psalm 137, the people of Israel, it says in verse 1, by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. They sat down by the rivers of Babylon, not the rivers of living water. The rivers of Babylon, which represents the culture of the world. They sat down by these rivers and they wept when they remembered Zion. One of the indicators that your faith has dwindled is when you talk about your past more than your future. You've stopped dreaming when all you have is memories and not expectation. We wept when we remembered Zion. Watch this. We hung our hearts upon the willows in the midst of it. So the, the instrumentations and the instruments that they had that they used to use to praise God, they hung them up. They hung them up and wept 
For there those who carried us away captive asked us for a song. Worship team, y'all get ready. They asked us for a song because we're going to sing a song because the Lord put in my spirit that some of our song has been silenced by defeat and heaviness. But this is a house of miracles. Amen. And something's about to come alive in this place. Do you believe that? It says, there those who carried us away captive, they asked us for a song. And those who plundered us requested mirth, saying, sing us one of the songs of Zion. Watch the people of God's response. They said in verse 4, how? Ain't that what it says? How? That's what some of you are asking today. How? Preacher, can I even praise God? You don't know all the stuff I've been fighting. How can you expect me to be joyful when the enemy has done so much? How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? Do you hear that? How shall we sing praise? How can I praise God in a place I've never been before? How can I give God praise when I'm facing something I've never had to deal with before? I know I'm talking to some people today and the Spirit of the Lord is moving in this house because some of you are facing new giants. You're facing new enemies. You've never had to deal with it before. Maybe the kids have reached a certain age and it's like, I don't know what to do with this. Because you've never been there before. Maybe it's something in your in your. Your, your household or your, your finances or maybe it's in your mind and you never had, you had good control over your mind before but now something has just seeped in and has caused something just to be on repeat and repeat and, and we've forgotten what Romans says about we are transformed by the renewing of our mind and we've stopped quoting scripture because we don't want to sound too spiritual you know I don't want to be so spiritual all the time, I think that's what we need Can you imagine growing up in the tribe of Judah where all they did in their language was praise the Lord. Hey, praise the Lord. Ain't God good? He's good all the time. Yes, he is. Yeah, won't he do it? Yes, he will. But now I believe we've allowed praise and our constant thanksgiving, which is the will of God concerning your life, to take a back seat at the fear of not sounding so spiritual all the time. I don't want to be that overbearing Christian. I don't want to. And I'm not talking about being some irritation. You know what I mean? Some little pest. I'm talking about somebody who is a source of thanksgiving. Who is a source of praise. Who believes what this word says. That this is the only truth. This is the only truth. And what this, I just believe that everything this book says is real. It's true. I don't need the universe to tell me anything. I'll go to the one who made the universe. I don't need any horoscopes to tell me my identity and why I act the way I do. I'll go to the Word of God to find out who I am. I don't need anything else telling me about me or about what's to come because I got the book. But they sat down and said, how can we praise? How can we sing? We're in a foreign land. We've been carried away captive. We've lost. We have failed. We have failed. There's no way I can give God praise in a season of failure. And here comes the enemy. Two, watch this. Stand to your feet. Two pieces of ammunition the enemy capitalizes on to silence your song. It is heaviness and it is defeat. It is heaviness, and it is defeat. And today, I believe the Lord God is here. He's right there where you're watching. And he wants to touch some people who are battling through this season of heaviness. Some of us, some of us, some of us have, for church context, this is one of the few times you've been back to church since 2020. And I love Dr. Tony Evans, what he says. He says, yeah, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian, just like you don't have to go home to be married. 
but stay away long enough and your relationship will be affected. And today, today I believe there's some of that residue left over. There's some that's still left over and God's like, I want my people to advance. I want my people to take to take steps. I want them to move into all that I have for them. But some of us are having a a struggle because the heaviness, maybe defeat has set in. And it's hard for us to lift our head. And we're the one, the enemy has his hand on our necks. When it's supposed to be the other way around. Did you know you are called to have dominion in the earth? That's part of God's original design for mankind. Take dominion. Dominion. Today, if if you're battling that defeated mentality, you just feel like you can't win. You feel like my life, my lot in life is just to lose. That's a lie from the pit of hell. For we have the triumph in Christ Jesus. If you're dealing with depression, dealing with just this cloud, this heaviness that rests on you. I want you to be a bold man or woman of God. And if you're in this room, I want you to begin to move this way. And we're going to sing this song, Come Alive in the Name of Jesus. And I believe a new praise, a new song is about to come alive in you. If you're watching this online, you need to put in the comment section your hand and raise your hand. And we're going to have our connections pastor, Zeb Hunley, is on the comment section. And he's going to pray with you through the comments. But we're going to pray for some people. Zach, I want you to begin to, to sing, Come Alive in the Name of Jesus. And listen, church, as we sing this, come on, we, we, most of us should, should know. They're going to put the lyrics up. We need to set an atmosphere of praise and life and life more abundantly in this house. Come on. Can we sing Come Alive? Come on, Zach, sing it. Come on, just worship. Everybody down here, lift your hands and worship. This is where it starts, right here. Open your mouth and just begin to sing Come Alive in the name of Jesus. Come Alive in the name of Jesus. Have your way, Holy Ghost. In the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. Worship, come on. She come alive in the name of Jesus. Come alive in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. We see come alive in the name of Jesus. Come alive in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. Come on, declare it.
generational bondage. Things that have been passed down. Fall right now in the name of Jesus. And we declare victory. We declare victory. Feel a leading to pray against that generational curse things that get passed down. That family say, you're going to be just like your mother, just like your father. That our poverty is going to be your poverty. That our giant will be your giant. But I declare in this house today, a generation of Davids that stand in front of that giant and say, today you fall. For the Lord God fights on my behalf. Come on, anybody believe in the Holy Ghost? Anybody believe in a prayer language in this house? Come on, won't you charge the atmosphere with your prayer language? We believe in the Holy Ghost prayer language. It's in your Bible. It's a gift of God. And we believe in it. Every generational chain that keeps you tied to debt, debt must be broken in the name of Jesus. Huh. I see solutions in the mailbox. I ain't saying that to get some kind of rise out of somebody. I see solutions in the mailbox. In the name of Jesus. Hey, shit. Come on, church. Come on. Do you believe he's moving? All things are possible. All things are possible. All things are possible. I said all things are possible. Somebody say all things are possible. All things. We break it in the name of Jesus. I dare somebody to open your mouth and begin to just sing, to begin to be thankful, to begin to worship. Everybody in the room, open your mouth. Come on. Tell God he's good. Tell him he's worthy. Come on. still believe your speech. in this place. This thing's being broken. Hey! Family. I feel that so strongly. Things in your family, in your bloodline that's been passed, that's been passed, that's been passed. We cancel every assignment. Every word curse spoken over you. Every word that said you couldn't do it. Every word that said you would never be successful. Every word spoken over you that does not line up with the word of God. Lift your hands. Every word spoken over you that does not line up with the word of God. We release it in that seed of a lie, that seed of doubt, and that seed from the enemy spoken in the form of a word curse, we uproot in the name of Jesus. And we declare right now that we have clarity by the Lord Jesus, that we have a purpose, that our identity is rooted in him and not based off what somebody said. We stand on the word of God and the truth that it says, I am a son I am a daughter of the Most High God. In the name of Jesus.
You got to look at me. Everybody, look at me. You, part of the way you continually fight defeat is you got to have a, a, this, this winner's mindset. And it, the best picture I can think of other than Jesus is Joseph in the Bible. Everything that could have happened that was bad happened to Joseph. His family disowned him, wanted to kill him, sold him into slavery. He got accused of doing something he didn't do, got thrown in prison. He got forgotten about. But the moment he saw those same brothers that meant him harm, the winner's mindset said, what you meant for evil, God used for good. See, that's what the victorious mindset says. It says, what they meant, what the enemy meant for evil, God used for good. Because if we believe scripture that he works all things for the good, even if it's bad right now, eventually it's going to be good. So I just got to be faithful to keep living with a victorious mindset. Right now in this moment, right now in this moment, you want to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Nobody moving, nobody stirring, our teams where they need to be. Right here, right now, every head bowed, every eye closed, you want to know Jesus. And I feel this too. You want to, you, you want to rededicate your life. I, I feel that. You want to recommit your life. We call that repentance. It means to turn back, to turn away from and to turn back to Jesus. You want to know Jesus for the first time. Or if you want to rededicate your life and you say, yeah, that's me. I want to recommit. I want you to lift your hand right now and say, yeah, that's me. I want to rededicate my, thank you. Thank you. Hands going up right here. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, 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 yes. Come on, come on, come on. I love it. Keep your hand up. Our team's coming right here with you. We're just going to come put a booklet in your hand, but we're going to pray. Our team's the only one that should be moving right now. Lift your hand if that's you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. We got some hands down front. If they came by and already gave you that, you can put your hands down. We're going to pray with you right here, right now. Isn't this exciting? Come on. Come on, we're going to pray a prayer together. Those of you who raised your hand, listen. Those of you who raised your hand, you're going to pray this prayer out loud, and everybody's going to say it with you. You ready? Say, Dear Jesus, I need you as my Lord and my Savior. And today... I receive you, and today I recommit my life to you. I believe you died on a cross for my sins, and you were buried, but you were resurrected by the power of God giving me new life. Let your spirit come alive in me now. I'm yours forever from this day forward. Amen. Come on, somebody shout with a shout of praise in this place. We appreciate you watching so much. As a matter of fact, why don't you just come join us live on a Sunday morning? We'd love to meet you in person. For more information about Hope Church, follow us on social media, go to our website, and there you can find out how to get involved at Hope Church, when our next baptisms will be, and how you can give and support this ministry financially. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you next time.